and thank you all. <clears throat> when I uh, was asked to do this, I said no about 17 times. <laughs> now, I don't know if you all know, um, I mean, such wonderful, wonderful, good women, right? <clears throat> and we were all kind of just scared out of our minds, <laughs> or stomachs, as the case may be. <laughs> Someone asked, did you enjoy your lunch? I said, oh, I think that's much later. <laughs> um, I apologize for um, needing to use some notes. I mean, this one, being Irish, can memorize pages and pages of poetry. But for some reason, I couldn't memorize this. <laughs> a little echo here. Um, Oh, it is my favorite necklace. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Help me, all right? It's all right? Okay. <clears throat> um, but I, you know, I came to realize what a gift this is. Um, for when you've been, you know, part of a small community for over 40 years, um, you come to know some people um, more intimately, and it is easy to, easier to share you know, your life's journey. But a lot of you, I don't know yet. And so um, I think you know, this opportunity to really tell you a little bit more about what my passion has been, my life's work um, with the Chinook Learning Center, and now known as the Whidbey Institute, um, that really is a gift to me, to have you know me a little bit more. So, this is a bit of a journey. Oh, I forgot. Someone of you needs to go and get my pack. <laughs> Lynn, where are you? <laughs> is there anyone who could help me do that? It's a black pack, you'll find out. Okay, it's very important because the title of, the, of this little talk is called A Pocket or a Backpack Full of Stones. It's called also Knowing Home, A Journey of Hope from Belfast <coughs> to the Universe and to Whidbey Island. Now I know that we're not supposed to talk about religion or politics this afternoon. But I can't tell you my story um, by leaving either of them out. For Vivian herself <coughs> grew up on the Shankill Road in Belfast, Northern Ireland, one of the last strongholds. Thank you. one of the last strongholds of the fierce Protestants who held to their dogmas and their culture and their heritage. My parents were among um, what was called the up-and-coming poor, meaning that they had little education. Their own parents had come from the fields, from the farms, into the city you know, to try to make a better life. And my parents did the same. They were determined <clears throat> to get out of the shipyard where my father worked as a machinist and the linen mills where my mother sat for 12, 14 hours a day since she was age 11. <clears throat> but <clears throat> they were caught, as so many like them, in a sectarian uh, tribal society uh, and had little understanding or certainly no appreciation of anyone who looked or acted differently. Um, I was taught to carry stones in my pocket, to throw at the Catholics, and I did. And I would run for my life 
when the papists, as we call them, came up my street. Once I hit a little girl with a stone, a little girl who skipped rope, just like I did. And then I sat down on the curb and I cried. There's something in a child that knows when something is wrong. Um, now, I had no idea as a child, really, what any of this prejudice meant. But only later did I come to understand how history throws its long, dark shadow on our present lives and our future. These memories formed my life's choices, but other memories did too. Um, I lived at the end of a dead-end street. That meant, supposedly, it went nowhere. But for me, it went everywhere. Because once at the end of the street, I got through the hedge, I got over the brook, and I went running, scrambling through the cow fields and into the glen just at the underside of the Moor Mountains in Belfast. Here in springtime <clears throat> were the wild primrose and the buttercup. Here also <clears throat> was my hawthorn tree. And I would climb up into that old tree and just, you know, sat there surrounded by white blossoms. And in the way that I think a child knows too, I understood that here was home. And somehow, <clears throat> I had a sense of being known as Vivian and loved. Now, like so many <clears throat> growing up in troubled families, my own home wasn't always a happy place. You know, I got thrown around a good bit because of an angry and depressed mother. <clears throat> and um, so I would rather st stay out in the glen, take the consequences later. <clears throat> For somehow this nature was <clears throat> a life-saving counter to the difficulties of my childhood. It also, as you would think, filled my Irish imagination with fairies and angels. Okay. My glen is no more. It is now a housing development, now part of a government scheme to create new neighborhoods where Catholics and Protestants would live together. Of course, it didn't work. So there is barbed wire now where my hawthorn tree once gave beauty to the world. I grew up and left Ireland, and I had the opportunity to travel and to meet people from other cultures and traditions. And I was so totally turned around in my sense of the world and my sense also of Vivian. I was so deeply touched and helped by the richness of other traditions and by my exposure to their spiritual wisdom. Um, this exposure <clears throat> challenged and changed forever my understanding of God and my Protestant Christian faith. And with a lot of personal anguish, I turned away from it all, just about. For the religious dogmas of my childhood um, had given to me what I came to believe was a dysfunctional understanding of my world and a terrible psychology. I remember <clears throat> Um, one of those clergy guys, you know, 
even though I'm married to one, <laughs> telling me, Vivian, don't ever forget that it was Eve who ate the apple. Uh, <clears throat> now, <clears throat> even though young, my Irish came up. And I said to him, <clears throat> but didn't Adam take a big bite too? <laughs> anyway, but you know, humorous as it is, that's painful stuff. Um, so, <clears throat> lost for a while. Um, <clears throat> I actually stumbled upon my own more ancient Irish tradition. It happened <clears throat> when I first traveled to the very small and ancient island of Iona in the Western Hebrides of Scotland. Three miles long, a mile and a half wide, these little feet have pretty much gone over all of it. And, okay, hold on just one little second here. Um, not to throw at Catholics. <laughs> <laughs> this came from that little bay right there. Now, um, I have quite a few of them in assorted shapes and sizes. And if any of you would like one, they'll be in the lobby afterward. <laughs> OK. Um, let's see. <laughs> it was the summer of uh, 1970 when my husband and I first traveled to Iona. We were at a kind of desperate part of our lives, having come through the movement to turmoils of the 60s. We've been involved a lot in the civil rights movement, anti-war, women's movement, new educational movement, etc. And had watched, um, actually, um, what was a very progressive church um, get itself all upset and divided, um, and more liberal people leaving while that particular church went you know, into a more conservative um, position about all those things that we cared so much about. So we pretty much decided you know, to leave um, that church as we knew it and our future in the university and to move to an old farm on Whidbey Island, which we had um, <clears throat> Am I okay? <laughs> I'm done. Okay. <laughs> you know what, Lynn? I really am okay. <laughs> I will. Okay. I will indeed. So we decided um, to turn this old farm without water, electricity, or anything. In fact, we used to go to Molly's gas station to fill our. our um, um, plastic bottles up with water. <clears throat> and it was that summer that confirmed us in that decision. And also something else happened for me. Because <clears throat> as I wandered the hills, knee deep in purple heather, with my son Timothy on my back, I discovered the older tradition of Irish Christianity that I knew nothing at all about growing up in Ireland. But here, you know, was a tradition that was so deeply um, founded on a belief not of original sin, but of original blessedness. You know, it, just, it affirmed that we are created in God's image, known and loved, and that we're here to do good things on behalf of each other. Um, <clears throat> this gave me a way to find a new spiritual home. And <clears throat> as some of you know, I have been, have had the great fortune of traveling to Iona um, you know, almost every spring. Some of you have come with me, you're all invited. But it really gave me a new sense of what home 
at a soul's level meant. Now, at this same time, <clears throat> I also came to know Rusty Schweikert, uh, one of the first, the earliest of the Apollo astronauts. And <clears throat> he talked to me also about what it means to know home. And he said, you know what? When you're in space, he said, you start watching for home. Oh, here comes California. Here comes New York. Here comes Whidbey Island. He didn't say that, but he could have, you know. <laughs> but then he said, something else happens. Here comes India. Here comes Africa. Here comes the North Pole. And you begin to identify with it all. You begin to see that this blue jewel of a planet is home. He told about another astronaut who, while tethered in space, um, put his thumb up. You can all put your thumbs up. And his thumb covered everything. His thumb covered everything that mattered to him. His own hometown, his family, you know. It also covered history and music and art and poetry. And all, you know, human beings, through our incredible consciousness and imagination, have brought to this shining planet. His thumb covered it all. So that made me realize <clears throat> that that's what home is all about. But sometimes I say to myself, well, so what? You know, lofty ideas, when there are hungry children, you know, when people are doing terrible things to each other, and the world, you know, is not always going through the greatest of times. And I get discouraged, and I think that perhaps so much of what my life's work has been about, you know, maybe doesn't matter a whole lot. Then I remember Agnes and Elizabeth. All right? It was one day <clears throat> when I was hiking back from <clears throat> the bay <laughs> with this, you know, in my pack, pack full of stones, and I came across these two elderly Scottish women in tweeds and good hiking shoes. And <clears throat> um, they said to me, uh, we want to go to the marble quarry to find some, you know, Iona's special green stones. These stones, by the way, are 1.7 billion years old. And I remember we've only been here for a few hundred thousand. So they are among the oldest stones on the planet. And they've been known for centuries as stones of healing and blessing. So Agnes, so I looked at the two of them, and I realized, having just you know trekked myself up, from this very boggy ravine, they weren't going to make it. And I said, I'm really sorry, but, you know, no worry, because today the marble quarry has come to you. So we plopped ourselves down on the grass, and I asked them, why do you come to Iona? And they said, <clears throat> we've been coming since we were young girls. We haven't been here in a while, and we're widowed. And we need a new supply of green stones. And Elizabeth said, <clears throat> I don't have much hope. She said, the world is going through a bad patch. And I get discouraged and dismayed. But, she said, Agnes here has hope. So if I put my arm in hers, hope will rub off. <laughs> And Agnes said, well, she said, you know, we're both um, almost 92. And she said, but I realized that if I don't have hope, then I'm hopeless. And that's no darn good to anybody. So she said, Iona has been a place that has offered hope to the world. So if I keep coming here, you know, I'll get my hope restored. 
Um, now, <clears throat> these two Scottish women went off <clears throat> with their pockets full of Iona's 1.7 billion year old stones of healing and blessing. And Agnes said, as she waved goodbye, she said, you know, I can't do much anymore, but I know how to pray. And she said, so every morning with my cup of tea, I pray for people and places that need help. Sometimes I have to have a lot of cups of tea. <laughs> <laughs> so she and Elizabeth left me with the shining light of hope all around. And that's what I would like to leave you with today. Um, not hope um, that's connected to outcome. Not hope with illusions about the difficulties of our lives and of our world, but strong hope that conveys encouragement to each other and that helps us know that anything we do, no matter how small, that is intended to be of help is indeed of help. And that part of our job, like Agnes here, you know, 91, was, you know, she was an encourager to Vivian. And I think that's what we're asked to do today. And I do, you know, pray that my own work, small as it has been here on Whidbey, you know, has been to create a place where people of all different traditions and backgrounds are made welcome and where we are indeed encouragers to each, to each other. Um, so as I leave you, um, I did actually <clears throat> ask St. Bridget to help me because I thought <clears throat> the Irish, you know, always say <clears throat> that unless um, you are dancing, tapping your feet, tapping your hands, you won't have a happy heart. And if you don't have a happy heart, you're not going to be any good to anybody. Bridget came through. Didn't she? <laughs> oh. <laughs>